Welcome to One Sharp Sword, cutting through to what matters most. I'm your host, Dr. P, Dr. Wayne Purnell, the Exponential Success Coach. And with me today, I've got Brian Gorman. He's a transformational coach. And uh, we do we do a lot of things in, uh, I guess, similarly. Uh, we come at it very differently. And when I see coaches like that, I just... I love to have the conversation. I love to have our audience, you listening, watching, to be kind of part of that, just to kind of listen in. Brian said something fascinating recently. He said um, we were talking about, and he's written about, organizational change. One of the things he said is that it's not the organization that changes. It's the people. And, uh, man, I just I love that because everything uh everything starts with the individual and without saying much more i shall let brian do talking <laughs> do the talking for himself brian gorman welcome to one sharp sword wayne thank you for having me here i really appreciate the opportunity and that is a mantra if you will that i often repeat with my clients whether we're talking about social change, whether we're talking about organizational change, or whether we're talking about personal change, it's the people that change. And the other piece of that that's so important to me is whether it's a global transformation or one person making a transform transformational change in their life, it's the same journey because people change, not organizations. It is the same journey. Um... And and it's it's like a family that needs to make a change. It's like a couple that needs to make a change. Um, anytime there's people, it's the people that make the change. Um, now, in my world, when I've done consulting, sometimes people are very allergic to that word. Almost, you say change, and people are are afraid of that. What's been your experience with that? Everything from, you know, keep it away from me to I just love change. I just love change. And I think a piece of the message that's important for listeners today is if you decide that you're done changing, your life's going to change anyway, because the world around you is going to continue to change. Um Change is difficult if you understand what that journey is that I was talking about. It's easier. It, it That doesn't mean it's easy. Yeah, it's kind of uh, the way I frame it is uh, sometimes the concepts are simple. Um, and even if the concepts are simple, sometimes the changes, the, the, the steps required to do the simple aren't always the easiest. Um, it's It's true. The world does keep changing. You know, why can't we just keep things the way they were? Why can't we go back again? Um, because we can't. <laughs> it was, I mean, uh, it, it's that's been true forever. We can't go back to uh, horse drawn carriages or before that. Um, you know, I think it was Emerson that said that the mind once expanded. Uh, uh, the mind once expanded can never return to its original dimension. And that once we see what's possible, and I think you're seeing this in organizations now, um, more and more technology, AI, it's a big deal. We're not ever going back to pre-AI the same way we're never going back to uh, pre-computers. They're part of who we are which means that as individuals, we need to adapt. Talk a little bit about, um, about your history, because I think that's really interesting. You didn't wake up one day and go, I'm going to be a transformational coach. Um, talk a bit about, I mean, you, you grew up during a, a kind of tumultuous time in the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that affected you? Yeah, I, I, I did. And I grew up somewhat isolated from that tumult. So I was born at the the dawn, if you will, of 1950. My birthday is Christmas Eve, 1949. 
And so we're in a post-war war era where really the effort is to create a, a stable social structure, a stable economy, uh, so forth and so on. So not a whole lot of uh, desire to change at the macro level. And yet it was also a time as I grew up, um, I remember reading in newspapers about lynchings in the South of the United States. Um, it, it, it horrified me at one level and yet I really didn't have the emotional awareness yet, the emotional intelligence yet, if you will, to really understand what that was all about. Um, so we get into the 1960s and um, we, we have the Freedom March and, and we have um, you know, desegregation uh, under the auspices of the military uh, in public schools down south. And, and then I go off to college in 1967 uh, as Vietnam is going on. And one of the things I say about my college experience is my freshman year, I had to wear a shirt and tie to the cafeteria for lunch on Sunday. My junior year, we shut the Uni Syracuse University down as part of the, the really national protest against the uh, deaths of Vietnam protesters at Kent State. Mm. So that was the environment. Um, my personal experience, I got to college as an introverted 17-year-old Eagle Scout. Um, I had determined that I was going to change my relationship with others to, to try to break out of that introversion. And, oh, by the way, I'm still an introvert. Um, and, and so I did what any introverted Eagle Scout would do, and I joined a fraternity. But I joined Alpha Phi Omega, which is the National Service Fraternity. And I volunteered to help start a uh, Boy Scout troop on the nearby Onondaga Indian Reservation. At the time, the university's mascot was a Native American uh, the, named the Saltine Warrior. And the Saltine Warrior was portrayed at uh, athletic events by Caucasian fraternity brothers dressed up in their idea of what Native American garb would be, which was from the John Wayne movies and running around like drunken Indians. And very quickly, I learned uh, as I was on the reservation that this was a racist and a xenophobic portrayal. And so by the end of my freshman year, I was trying to get the university to change the mascot. It took the Onondaga Nation 10 years to make that change happen. But there was this spark inside of me that I didn't even recognize for decades, but there was the spark inside of me that ignited around being a, a catalyst and a guide for change. And that has been the common thread through my career ever since. This is amazing. I uh, am so delighted. I never know where these conversations are going to go. And, um, you know, to have you go back decades and to look at um, this is where a social conscience comes from. This is how it's expressed. Um, you know, that the, these days it's uh, there's social media, maybe. Um, but it's not, it's, you know, and protests are seen very differently. Um, and they're done very differently. I think, <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting. Where did your, where did your sense of, huh, that's not really right to treat people that way. Where did that come from? It's, you know, because in some cultures, Across and we have multiple cultures across the United States and beyond. Um, within the United States, there are there are cultures. We are we are part of what we're born into. Um, you didn't have a great perspective until you had a great perspective. Where did that come from? I've never really thought about that question until you asked it. 
and and what comes to mind is um, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and uh, I still have my attendance pin with all of its bars, um, reflecting the fact that that I was a very uh, regular churchgoer for many years. But I can remember, um, so it was very early grades of elementary school because um, we didn't even at that age go into the church service per se. We had our own service uh, in, in an upstairs auditorium. And I can remember being told how we were God's chosen children. And even at that age, I thought, I don't think I'm that special. What about the rest of the people in the world? And I think that was the seed that um, really began that process. And then I grew up in, in literally a Caucasian suburb of New York City, um, but in the next town over, which is where my father had grown up, where we went to church, where my scout troop was. Um, was much more ethnically and racially and economically diverse. And again, just meeting my peers in, in, in church or, or in scouts, um, who were growing up with one parent who were living, quote, in the projects, um, who couldn't afford to go to Boy Scout camp. Um, it wasn't easy for my parents to send us, but they, they could afford it. And, and so I grew up with an awareness of, disparity and and then i think again the the race riots the freedom marches the 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 really becoming aware of what those lynchings meant um i think all of that planted the seed for me that said there is justice and injustice in the world that's amazing i love the phrase uh awareness of disparity i think that 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 really speaks to our ability to make a difference. Um, you know, one of, one of my sayings is awareness leads to choice and choice leads to greater awareness. And when you have an awareness of disparity, you, you can't unsee it. And it almost naturally moves you to do something about it. And I just, I love that statement. Uh, or to not do something about it. At which point it's a choice. It's definitely it, it is a choice. And and you and I both know people who have that awareness and choose to not do something about it. It is true. All right. So let's talk about this. This actually is a great bridge, even though it's a a decades distant bridge uh from where you were to where you are now. I think it's a great topic bridge. Um because the idea of awareness of disparity leads to action or deliberate inaction. Uh, it is it is based on threat of loss of power, usually, where people choose to do nothing. Um, if I did something, I would lose the privilege I have. And that is a uh, that is the stance that many people take unwittingly i think um but it also and i should say it also affects uh organizational change it also affects how uh organizational culture exists do you want to talk about how you've seen it um i have examples that may spark you or if you if you've got some that come to mind right away that'd be awesome so one of the questions I often ask my clients is, where does culture live? Mm. And where culture lives is in the mindsets and the behaviors, the muscle memory of the people in the organization. We have cultural artifacts in the workspace, whatever that workspace is. We have cultural traditions. We have cultural stories, but culture, how I show up, and and what I do when I'm there, that lives inside of people. Very interesting. Uh, you know, Wayne, I host podcasts as well and hosted a podcast um, last fall with two individuals, two colleagues who are black. 
And our topic centered around why it's important to support leaders of color. And my first question basically was, why is it important? And what they highlighted, which I think is so many of us are so blind to, is that institutional norms, institutional culture, the way we do things around here, typically the way we think about things, the way we interact with others, all of those things are typically driven by the unconscious, often unconscious norms of the majority. And most often that is a Caucasian majority and it's a male majority. And so give you an example of of the male piece of that. Um, An organization a, a friend of mine was consulting with, a nonprofit that found that they couldn't get women into the senior levels of the organization. Women would rise to a certain level and then they leave. And so they started bringing in coaches for these women and they'd rise to a certain level and they'd leave. And she came in and she came in with more of an anthropological perspective And what she saw very quickly was what she calls a cultural artifact. This organization for its executives at a certain level had a 7.30 a.m. stand-up five days a week. And women typically were getting their children ready for school, Mm -hmm. getting their children off to school. So that cultural norm which was not intentionally set to filter women out, um, also wasn't in the consciousness that this doesn't work for everyone. You know, um, organizations that think we need to have social events, so we need to go out drinking on Friday nights or um, bowling on Thursdays or whatever, that may or may not work for everyone. Single parents aren't going out drinking after work. Um, Those of us who are introverts are likely, more likely to go out drinking with one or two buddies than with the whole department. So we have these cultural norms, these social norms, if you will, inside of our organizations that are biased. Mm -hmm in ways that we're not even aware of. That's awesome. Uh, Some of my recent work uh, features the term uh, perceptual bias. And my latest TED talk, it's a it's a long and fancy way of saying we need to look at things differently. It's uh, how a parallax perspective can disrupt perceptual bias. And basically, the concept here is assume you're missing something. Like make no assumptions in the world except one. And that is assume you're missing something about the context, the other person or yourself. Um, and, and it's great. You have these cultural anthropologists that come in and go, you've got a, you've got a cultural artifact that does harm, um, uh, to, <laughs> to the very thing you say you want to promote. It's amazing. It's really, it's amazing. I think it's so important. Um, you know, you look at the 7.30 stand-up, you look at the bullying or the drinking. Um, even also now, as we look at the hybrid workforce, you know, some are remote. Are we remote first? Are we, we remote exclusive? Are we back to butts in seats? And what I'm seeing, and I'm certain you've seen some of this as well, in terms of cultural norm, is uh, is that those that show up, at the office, they're actually treated better um, because they're there, they're participatory, they're having conversations, and you actually have to go out of your way. So it is a, it's perceived as work. It's like it's psychic work in order to reach out to somebody and try and be friendly with them if they're not in the office. And those that are there are perceived as more productive. Mm. And they may be. 
and they may well not be. Exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. For too many years, we thought productivity was measured by butts and seats. Um, you know, am I staying until my boss leaves so that my boss believes I'm committed and productive and all those kinds of things? Um, I have a good friend who uh, was for many years an accountant. And during tax season, he'd tell the story about going in and there'd always be those few accounts who would be in the same clothes as yesterday bragging about how they spent all night working. And they'd spend the day going from office to office to office, bragging about how they had spent all the last night working instead of working. Mm -hmm. Again, different people work better in different environments. Exactly. There is a reason for us to be together. Sometimes. Exactly. And sometimes we do our best work alone. Agreed. <laughs> it's, it's true. One and, of the, yeah. And what I was going to say is one of the things I have heard fairly regularly from uh, senior executives is, but we need people back in the office because that's how we formed our culture. That's how we, you know, bring new employees into the fold, so forth and so on. And it is how they did it. Uh, that said, I was having a, a conversation with uh, Chris DeSantis a while back. And Chris is the author of the book, Why I Find You Irritating. <laughs> and it's a book on intergenerational conflict and intergenerational differences in the workplace. And um, Chris said a couple of things that are very important about this topic. He said, if you want to know how to form a culture virtually, ask your younger employees. They have established relationships that in some cases will last a lifetime with people around the world who they have never met and never will meet. Um, and, and he went on to add that the mistake that we so often make is not, this is not the mistake. We raise our children to fit into the norms of their generation. The mistake is when they and their peers come into the workplace, we expect them to adapt to the norms of our generation. Exactly. And they're different. Neither's right, neither's wrong. They're different. You know you are bigger than the life you are leading. It really is time to attend to that thing you've wanted to do or have, but you've been putting off. It's time to step into that dream you've parked for someday. It's time to claim true well-being, both personally and professionally, without giving up the success that got you here. It's time to check out Dr. Purnell's signature small group retreat, the Exponential Success Summit. Explore ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. Seats are extremely limited as this is a very special small group event. www.ExponentialSuccessSummit.com. Is there a way of doing a cultural blend, like in, in your experience? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I, I can give you. I can give that. you the. I can give you the the soundbite answer of how to do that. Okay. Shut up and listen. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, it's a that's a tricky one, isn't it? It's a tricky one. This is what listening sounds like. <laughs> it is it's a tricky one how do you how do you prompt a conversation where you can do exactly that just shut up and listen how do you like for your advice for leaders for example what would you don't gather people together and say okay talk like i have some ideas I, I, i'm curious about yours uh in a way, you almost do do that. Um, it's very interesting. I was coaching um, a fairly high executive not too long ago, and and he his division had two parts to it, and he got moved from the head of one part to the head of the other part. And he came into a coaching session. He was really disturbed. He said, "I'm no longer the smartest person in the room." 
I knew everything where I was before. He said, now I don't. And I said to him, where you were before, when you were in the room with others, you may have been the smartest person in the room. Were you smarter than the collective in the room? And it's, it, it starts with becoming aware mm-hmm. of the fact that I don't know everything. Mm-hmm. For some people, that's you know an awareness they, they, they don't want to accept, but it's true. None of us knows everything. And then beyond that, it's so become curious about what you don't know. See, you're singing my song. It's awesome. I'm a huge fan of curiosity. Most people know that. That um, I even use Curious George as a uh, uh, as as my spirit animal, my my totem that I take with me. Even when I consult, sometimes I'll bring a a little Curious George guy to remind people: stay curious, stay in that space of wonder. And when you do that, it keeps you out of judgment. When you when you're in a space of, well, I wonder what that's about or I wonder what that means. It's different than assuming what it means or or judging that it's better than or less than or doesn't belong somehow. It's interesting. Yeah. Talk a little bit about what you're doing now, what you and where you see yourself going. Like, what's the you're consulting you have organizations you you consult with you talk with executives um where do you see yourself going and um like what kind of messages are you hoping to impart um big question that's the only kind i ask usually uh a few years ago i i gave a, a tedx talk and I began with a question, and it's a question I ask any client who comes to me looking personally or professionally to make a significant change. What makes your heart sing? Mm -hmm. What makes your heart sing? The work I'm doing makes my heart sing. And so where do I see myself going? I see myself singing along as long as I can. Awesome. Um, where do I see the bigger picture going is a more challenging question. And I've always been known for looking a little bit over the horizon. I believe personally that we are on the verge of a change in the future of work as significant as the industrial revolution. Agreed. I believe COVID was the catalyst. It brought awareness to people who thought they had to work nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven, had to commute two, three, four, five hours a day, uh, had to work for that vacation in jobs that they didn't like or they despised, became aware that there's a different way of life. People became aware that there is a way to blend not just balance, but blend what brings an income with the rest of their lives. Um, And you mentioned early on um, in in this conversation, computers, artificial intelligence, um, learning how to work virtually and hybrid and um, building trust uh, across the airwaves, if you will. And all of those things, I believe, uh, the four-day work week, um, finding ways in which we can produce the same or more, not measured by the hours we spend butts in seats, but by we by, by, by what we actually accomplish. I think all of these things are in this cauldron that is going to produce a, a totally different world of work that we can just begin to imagine now. I agree with all that. I agree with all of that. The the idea of um, values. I think that the pandemic gave us back our values. Here's a giant mirror. You are forced to sit with yourself in your four walls, in your space, 
and not go to work and be told what to do, when to do it, all that stuff, just that it needs to be done. And the pendulum swung so hard. Um, I did a, I did a news interview at one point on uh, revenge bedtime procrastination, which, which is people would get up early, check their email, uh, work through lunch, work through dinner, eat at their desks, check their email one more time. Oh, just one more time. And then realize that they'd spent the whole day on and off of work. They'd given more than they would have had they gone into the office and now it's me time. And so they put off bedtime until much later. And that's the revenge bit. It's me time. Darn it. I'm going to, I'm going to have time for me. And they put off sleeping, um, which was disrupting their ability to work and to have social engagement and all that stuff. Um, we got values back. We got a sense of, well, this does matter to me. I want me time. I want work time. I want to be valued for the work I do. I want to know that the work I do is meaningful. All of those statements started to percolate up. And I think that's so important. You're seeing it. You're predicting the major change, which I absolutely agree with. Um, and Wayne, I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that we're also seeing the push against that, the pull against that, whatever, um, you know, you have people like the CEO of Goldman Sachs saying work from, work from home is an aberration. You have Elon Musk saying, if you're not in my office, at least 40 hours a week, go steal time from somebody else. Um, you have some major corporations that even though people are working remotely, every keystroke is being tracked. Oh, yes periodically their cameras are taking pictures of where, whether or not they're sitting in front of their computers. Um, all of that, as far as I'm concerned, and, and when you talk about values, is devaluing the humanity of the people who work for you. I have done everything I can to remove the word employee from my vacation or uh, I'm sorry, from my vocabulary, because employees are interchangeable parts of the machine. Awesome. No one that works for you is an interchangeable part. I use the term team member. What do you use? People. Okay. I want to have mm. relationships with people, not with roles. Good deal. Love it. I love it. Um, that's so good. Yeah, I, uh, I will tease that, um, you know, saying that you have staff is sort of like announcing you have an infection. And, um, <laughs> and employees seems to be a lump of a group of people that you can, um, that are less than downsize, you yeah. can, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're somehow less than. Yeah. I like the word team member. I'm always a fan of people. And you use the word humanity, which uh, really, it got me smiling. And I was, you know, you probably saw me writing. Um, humanity is so important as part of a culture. How do we bring that back? How do we show it? Um, and for me, it starts with me, right? And for each, and that's the, that's the, the message that I bring is it starts with one. It starts with each individual as an accountable individual. Um, yeah. Are you bringing that to your, the leaders that you're consulting with as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. I use the term enlightened leadership. Okay. We really, even moving into COVID, so many of our organizations were some form of the industrial age command and control. Mm. Um, you know, yes, we say we had matrix organizations in some cases, but there was still a boss that I wanted to make sure I impress. Um, enlightened leadership is really about, it's about servant leadership. It's about that curiosity. It's about that my role as a leader, when Wayne comes onto my team, is to build a trusting relationship with Wayne, 
That means I need to get Wayne to know Wayne as a person. Wayne needs to get to know me as a person. Um, it's about understanding what excites Wayne to get up and come to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. Because if I know if if I know that and it's not what I was hiring for, I shouldn't have hired Wayne in the first place. And that becomes a conversation. Yeah. But if it is something that I hired him for, it's how do I align what I as 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 a team leader, if you will, and and the greater organization, how do I align what we need with what gets Wayne juiced? Because awesome. if I can do that now, I'm addressing quality, I'm addressing productivity, I'm addressing retention. Um, now my role is to help Wayne continue to grow because we all want to continue to grow and learn and not to assume that what Wayne brought to this position is all that Wayne has to offer. Mm -hmm. Because for whether it's um, something new sparked inside of Wayne or whether it's this job has become repetitive and doesn't offer an opportunity for growth. I'd rather see Wayne move across the organization and bring value somewhere else than to leave. All of these, these things about um, how we relate to people as their leader um, are, are parts of, and, and there's a lot more parts of what I call enlightened leadership. Mm -hmm. Do you have a framework, you know, when you talk about enlightened leadership, is there a, is there, I, I get a sense that you don't do the uh, L is for leadership. E is for, but do you have a, uh, I, I do not I just want to see you flinch for a second. That's so <laughs> There's only one acronym in my vocabulary, and it is Judith Glasser's um, model for building trust. The acronym is TRUST. There's no secret club there. Everybody can figure out what you mean. It's about the values. It's about the humanity. It's about all the things we've been talking about, Wayne. That's great. That's great. What? key message i have i have listeners who are machinists i have listeners who work as management in uh in departments of grocery stores i have listeners uh that are the presidents of major banks um so the listenership is broad and varied and um, my sense is that each person as an individual is a leader. You're being watched by someone. You are modeling for someone, um, which makes you a leader to someone and to be your best in that. Uh, for you, if there's, a, if there's a message, the reason I define my audience for you here is if there's a message that you wanted to bring to the broad audience as it is, what message is that? Well, to, to reinforce what you're saying, leader has nothing to do with title. Do you have people following you? Yeah. Do you have people following you? So the message that, that I, and, and I alluded to this earlier, really tried to convey is find your passion and learn to sing along. Mm. It, it's not necessarily easy. It may well not be a one step away from where you are now. Yeah. But there can be great joy and fulfillment in anything that we do. Um, just very quickly, um, often refer to a study I, I did, uh, or not that I did, but, but that I read about custodians and hospitals. And some of them went to work and they did their job and they got their job done by the end of their shift. And they defined their job as custodians and hospitals. Some of their peers defined their, themselves as ambassadors for the hospital or 
as um, patient caregivers. And those custodians would do things like, I get my job done as quickly as I can because Mrs. Smith down in room 403C has not had a visitor in a week. And I'm going to spend some time with Mrs. Smith before the end of my shift or um, walk into the room and look up at the ceiling. And the researchers asked that particular individual, what are you doing? And she said, what do you think a patient in bed is looking at all day long? I want to connect with their experience. Mm -hmm so that I can connect with them. So a big piece of it is mindset. How do I find the purpose and the passion in what I'm doing? And if it's not there, how do I find the path to where it is? Love that. Uh, connecting to the other's experience, you, you can't go wrong with empathy right? Putting yourself in someone else's place and really recognizing what it is that they are truly experiencing. It's, it, it's so good. It's so powerful. And in that example, it, it does serve to underscore uh, how we make our jobs or anything we do much more, um, I don't know, it has more gravity, much more weighty. You know, it's like, it's meaningful. We make a difference in someone else's life. That's meaningful. That's huge. So very cool. Very good. Um, what, uh, what did I not ask you? What do you, what were you hoping to share that, uh, that I didn't get to? I just love having these conversations and going where they go. I do too. Uh, clearly uh, we could talk for hours and hours about any piece of this. Agreed. Um, but I'm I'm not sure that there's a single uh, sort of high level note that we haven't hit that I'd want to hit today. Yeah, I really I appreciate it. I mean, you've talked about trust. You've talked about uh, shifting the concept of employee to these are people bringing back humanity. Um, your question, what makes your heart sing is parallel to my question, which is what would you treasure? What would you actually trade uh, if you were gardening? What would you give up to make sure something grew? Like, what would you treasure? What what makes your heart sing is so, it's like, that implies joy, right? That's like, that is so good. And uh, if, if I can just jump in real quick on that, Wayne, what's please. important is you don't need a whole lot of detail. I mean, I've uh, asked that of a financial advisor who he could tell you know, he did. He told me, this is the office building I want to buy. This is how I want to decorate it. This is, you know, how I want to provide concierge services to my uh, clients and so forth. He could paint a big picture. I had one client who said, all I can tell you right now is this is how I want to feel at the end of the day. These are the kind of people I want to be working with. And I want to be known for my signature red blazer. That was all she had to start with. That's all you need. Yeah. She didn't know what that career path was going to be. Yeah. She had no clue, but she knew how it wanted, how she wanted to feel when she was on that path. All you need to know is where you're going and what that first step is. That's so good. And the feeling, I mean, the feeling, what do you want to feel like is so powerful. I want to feel good at the end of the day. What is that? What's the good? Uh, I have a thing in my vision just to go to specifics where it's a cross between dryer sheets and chocolate chip cookies that people feel. And when I work with people, I want them to feel like they're being uh, held in a, in a heavy, warm blanket with the, that kind of smell wafting through. It's like, that's comfort. And they, and it's, you get a sense of, oh, that's what it is to work with, <laughs> with me. That's what I want around me, right? I want that. I want to feel that. And I want to build that. That's like, that's when, when you can get somebody who describes that as a culture of what they want. Um, 
how does that make your heart sing? It's like, wow, big. Yeah. 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 Um, that's awesome. That's really good. I love that. I love I love all of what you're you're talking about. Um, so good. So if people want to reach you, best way of doing that is it via email? Um, um or is it your is it your website or uh, email? Brian B R I A N at transforming lives.coach. That's Brian at transforming lives.coach. My website is transforming lives.coach. And they can also find me on LinkedIn. At Brian Gorman. Brian Gorman. It's a little bit more than that, but if they search Brian Gorman, they'll recognize the picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. The picture, the uh the website and the email address will all be part of the show notes. Uh, very good, Brian. Thank you so much for being here. This is a it's it's been a great conversation. I just I appreciate you. I appreciate your work. Appreciate your good thoughts. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Wayne. Have a great day. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. This is a one sharp sword cutting through to what matters most. My guest today was Brian Gorman uh, at transforminglives.coach. I'm Dr. P, Dr. Wayne Purnell, the Exponential Success Coach, and we'll see you here next time. Thanks for joining us.